Welcome back, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne. Return to us at last. And for, for John, who doesn't know Fuliana, this is Fuliana's first recording back after almost 12 months. And the listeners are glad to have her back. And we are welcoming on a return visit to us today, John Fabon. John spoke to us early last year, early in 2023, just before his next book was released. And so we're going to hear a little bit about that today. But we're also going to follow up on some questions that came through after his last visit to us. If you haven't met John before, let me introduce you to him. John Pavon has spent two decades in the business of saving our earth. After leaving his role at the United Nations, John travelled the world studying the impacts of sustainability firsthand in factories, on fields and in Fortune 500s. His mission is to move sustainability from theory to practical strategies that help people and businesses confidently make real impact. Over his 20-year career, he had the privilege of working with the United Nations, McKinsey's AC Nielsen, and as a consultant with BSR, the world's largest sustainability-focused business network. He's the founder of Fulcrum Strategic Advisors, Program Director for the Conference Board's Asia Sustainability Leaders Council, and serves on the board of the advisors to the US Green Chamber of Commerce. John now is also the author of two books. The first one, Sustainability for the Rest of Us, Your No Bullshit Five-Point Plan for Saving the Planet, and The Great Greenwashing, which has just recently come out and he's been around the world launching it. Welcome back, John. It's like a fun yeah. little family reunion. Good to see you both. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're glad you're <laughs> Great. As I said, we had a number of questions that uh, came in last time. The first of those was about a scenario that the particular listener has that is talking about specialist needs. So this, for the listeners, if I just give you some background, this is about a special needs service provider for early childhood intervention and education. What the listener is talking about is that they use, partic- they use rice as a play element because if they use sand, which would be the normal thing that would be used, the children will eat the sand and they don't eat the rice, which is is quite interesting in itself. But the tactile sensation of the rice is better for them in a learning sense. What our listener is concerned about is that her staff and to some extent the organisation, the the corporate organisation she works for, are concerned about the sustainability implications of them using uh, rice for for this play activity and is there some way that they can research what else they can do, not in terms of what they can use, but in what they can do in in a corporate sense to show responsibility in terms of sustainability, that they have thought about it, that they're following the research, that there's what she said was, is there some offset plan that they can use? So all of that said, John... (laughs) <laughs> it's, an, it's an interesting it's it's a really interesting uh a predicament and i think overall it's important to remember and this applies to to everybody is you don't have to do everything especially in a sort of a corporate sense and i think a lot of times people feel as if as a corporation you need to represent every single thing and sort of be like greenpeace but yes. you know in a lot of ways There are particular elements within a corporation, regardless of if it's in education or in mining, particularly mining, that you you won't be able to do particular things. And I think certainly with this particular example, there may not be necessarily a need to try to offset that, especially if it's rice, because rice is a a fairly abundant Mm -hmm. sort of uh, source. So it's not as if they're using a a small plastic beads that are manufactured in a developing country by by a child. So I I think generally speaking, they could probably sleep quite well that they're, they're not necessarily having a massive impact. But I think even more interesting is that they're they're thinking of this and they're saying, yes. oh, that this might be an issue. What can I do to prevent it? And I think that is the most important part because that's yep. showing that people are understanding what's going mm-hmm. on and that every little piece of the puzzle within their corporations may have a positive or a negative impact. So even just demonstrating that they've thought through the reason of why they're doing this and the potential implications for anybody you know, sort of watching or their stakeholders, I think that is enough sometimes just to not necessarily try to to hide anything. I always tell people, you know, your your stakeholders don't need you to be perfect. They just don't want you to lie to them. So just showing a little bit of forethought into this. And then also if there's a particular passion point or a thing that the company is doing quite well, whether it's at a local or, or you said they're sort of a, a bigger a bigger organization, 
bringing that to the forefront and talking about that as well as mm -hmm. a way to, we use the word offset, she, uh, your, your caller used the mm -hmm. word offset to, mm -hmm. to show that they've thought through this and that they are doing things to make it a little bit better. But I think they can rest pretty easy that, uh, they're, they're well, doing good. Yeah. Thing. But I, I think the essence too of the answer is that is the not trying to do everything and they don't have to have all yeah. of the answers. But if really, really rewarding to know that they are thinking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think particularly in that space where it is, and remember when we talk about sustainability, that's obviously a loaded term. Sustainability, usually people think the green side of things, which is mm -hmm. important. And it's the part that gets the most PR, but it's only one portion of everything we do. There's an entire social element and education, particularly around, uh, you know, different sorts of populations that this person is working directly with. Yep. Yep. That, that social good, honestly, in my opinion, would outweigh any potential small impact mm -hmm from the environmental perspective that they could be having for using rice. So yeah. balance it out a little bit and look at the larger picture. That's excellent. Just on that point, some of the feedback that I got from the listeners to your previous podcast was very much around the point that they were so glad they heard you because they always thought green and not beyond green, if you know what I mean. And, and now they felt they had more information and they were happy with that. Absolutely. And it's it's really important because I think a lot of people, maybe we care about the environment, at least we say we care about the environment, uh, you know, but maybe that's not somebody's particular passion point. Maybe they care about people educating the next generation, or maybe they love animals, but yeah. they, they wouldn't necessarily attribute that to doing something quote unquote sustainable. But at the end of the day, it's really an umbrella term for anything that builds a better future for people or the planet. So anything anybody is doing, whether it's green or on the social side, or even like I do, I work with corporations on on making sure they're held to account with all the stuff that they're doing and saying that they're doing. All of that contributes to moving the needle in the right direction. And people should be very happy that they're doing anything at all. Can I just follow up on the that, that term sustainability offsets? Is that something that you're hearing? It's a bad term. Okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a it's a it's a bad thing, uh, and it's just okay. sort of it's just sort of really starting to to enter. I think the public vernacular. We've been talking about it within the industry for for decades. And for anybody who doesn't know what an offset is, it's basically a way to, I'm going to paint with very broad strokes, do a bad thing, but pay somebody off to make it look like you're doing a good thing. So it doesn't necessarily solve a problem, even though on the surface it may seem to. So we see it uh, particularly uh, in today on when you buy a flight. You know, you can you can have the mm. the privilege of paying Qantas three extra dollars to have them offset your flight, which actually doesn't offset it. What it does is on paper, they say they're going to plant a tree somewhere on your behalf, mm -hmm. but that doesn't yeah. environmentally offset a flight that you're on. So it's, it's sort of smoke and mirrors. And I think just corporations for, for decades have really relied on this as a way to show they're moving in the right direction. But only recently have people started to wake up and say, eh, you guys, no, it's essentially an excuse for bad behavior. Ties in nicely with a number of the other questions that we got about uh, greenwashing, particularly. Yeah. And, and green scamming, are they two different things or interlinked? Interlinked, absolutely. So in The Great Greenwashing, I tried to break down and make things, like I do in all my writing or when I talk to people, I, I want to yeah. make this as now simple just, as possible. I'll just stop you there. I'll just stop mm -hmm. you there and say, when you say in The Great Greenwashing, which is available on... <laughs> my publicist would love that you just did that. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, continue. In, in The Great Greenwashing, which is available yes. on all potential channels and in every bookstore known to man in Australia. We actually, it, it's been out for about a year in Australia to, to rave reviews and it just launched in uh, North America in yep. March. So just a few months ago, which has been, it's been really, really good. Uh, right. I, I, I tried to break down and make things as simple as possible because Anything in sustainability is so loaded and scientific jargony and, and just honestly, it's not the sexiest topic in the world. So I try to make it as approachable as possible. So with greenwashing, any type of scams or lies that were being were being peddled, it can come in a few different forms. So there's the marketing side, what I call green speak. So that's yeah. how companies talk about what they're doing. It's how they package things. They love to use green packages and pretty pictures to try to denote meaning, which yeah, maybe they're doing good things, but uh, you know the package isn't going to be the be all and end all of that. Then there's also the the misdirection. That's another big part. So look over here, not over here. Sometimes companies will inundate you with data, or they will post 
a pretty picture of kids on the front of their sustainability report, but don't look at the child labor we have in, in Mozambique sort mm. of stuff. And the third big one, which I didn't even know existed until I started to do the research, is green scamming. Green scamming, so it fits very nice, nicely into the world of greenwashing, but essentially green scamming is when larger, particularly cashed up corporations, they will actually fund lobbying groups groups that on the surface look like they are NGOs. One of my favorites, and I don't recall the exact name, but it is a European media conglomerate. I think their name is something to the effect of the, the European Media Center for Climate Integrity. So on the surface, it looks as if, you know, they're, they're promoting information about climate change and what we can do to be better. But in fact, it's funded by an oil company and their entire purpose is to peddle out misinformation on social media. So, mm. It, just like the, it says on the on the tin, green scamming, it's literally being scammed by the the usually the worst of the worst. So we're talking the most unsustainable industries, oil, gas, mining, defense and tobacco. Those are the the four big, big, bad ones. The, I should have named that chapter of the book now that I think about it, The Four Horsemen. That would have been a much better name. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that. It, it's named the unsustainable in the book, but Four Horsemen would ah, have been much better. Yeah. Reprint. <laughs> Reprint. <laughs> just in, in terms of that, are consumers aware, or are they becoming more educated about being able to, to pick out when they're being scammed or when there's greenwashing happening? I, and, I th- and, and then the second part of that is, if they are, where do they go? Where is the groundswell of that support? Absolutely. And I they may consumers may not have the the vernacular around what's happening, but I think from a, a gut instinct and certainly given, you know, particularly over the past year, how how wary people are of taking claims at face value with whether that's with corporations or politicians. Today people are much more wary when they go to the store and they they pick up something and their gut sort of says, Hmm, that doesn't seem right, or or you know, this is sort of fishy, or I don't understand what this claim is. You know, this claim said that this product is two times more whatever, but they didn't give me any context as to what that means. So consumers are really starting to become uh, quite wise to these things going on. Whether or not they're actually going to spend their hard-earned money, especially in economic times like these, to make the right choice is a very different thing. And one of the things that we come up against, especially in market research around sustainability, is when someone's given a survey and it says, you know, would you spend more money to buy an organic product or a good product. Nobody is going to say no to that on paper, but in reality, will they actually do it? We don't know. So the numbers are sort of fudged because we see these, I think I saw one in Australia where it said 90% of millennial consumers will pay more at the till for sustainable products. But we know in practice, that's, that's not the reality. So we know, yeah. But we know just you sort of anecdotally that people are much smarter with the stuff going on. They are trying to purchase from companies where possible that are better for the planet, better for people type of companies. The complicating issue is that as that starts to happen, companies that are bad, they're always going to be bad. So they will find ways to invest more into their marketing function to try to make the greenwashing even slicker to basically mm-hmm. pull the wool over the eyes of people. So it's going to take continuous, unfortunately, I'm going to say this and people aren't going to like this, research every time you go to the store. And I know that is a burden. I don't want to do research when I go to the store and I guarantee nobody else does either. But that's sort of the reality of today. And I think we talked about this last time. If I had a crystal ball and I looked 10 or 15 years into the future, those companies today that aren't playing ball, that aren't doing the right thing, there's not going to be a space for them. So mm-hmm. when a consumer of the future goes to the store and they they look at the shelf, all the choices will be the right choice at a price point because everything's at scale that is okay for their wallet. We're just in this transition period now where we have to do the research and yeah, we have to pay a little bit more for the time being. Are consumers looking more for data to back the claims up now? I think they are. So certainly looking into maybe not the data points per se, unless it's a company that is quite far along in their sustainability journey that that offers that up, which there there are some that do that. But really fact checking. So I think uh, at least for me, and I know some people that, that I would talk to when we're researching a company at the store, we would probably look at the news about that company versus the company's website, right? So the company's website, I mean, that's marketing speak, so that doesn't really help. But if you you go to the news section on Google, you can see pretty quickly what, what comes up and if a company is good or bad. So you're sort of doing a quick sense check. You don't need to go into too much detail unless 
you have the time to do so. But I think consumers are looking for both qualitative and quantitative data points to try to make a decision. Let's take a break there in our discussion with John Pabon. Join us for part two. But for now, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne, and this is Inside Exec. <laughs> 